Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Subscription Scaled. I'm your host, Nick Frederick. With me today is Ed Visit, who is the founder and CEO of Festival Pass. Ed, welcome to the show. Hey, Nick. How are you? Thanks for having me. Awesome. Great to have you on here today. I'm excited to learn more about Festival Pass, but let's start with a little bit of background of yourself, kind of what brought you to uh, start Festival Pass, and then, of course, tell us more about it. Sure, sure. So um, just like I get to any business, there's context. Um, I've been an entrepreneur most of my adult life. I was uh, started off as an investment banker in New York and uh, up until 1999 and left to start my first e-commerce company. Um, it was called City Stuff. We, we sold things that made cities famous. Um, so anybody that knows knows the uh, different fun things you get from various cities. Uh, ended up uh, selling that company in 2001 um, to a company in Stanford, Connecticut. Um, and then um, fast forward, I, I had a experiential marketing firm for most of the 2000s, about a 70 person firm in New York. Um, and we bring a lot of uh, big, inter interesting brands into um, live events, uh, where, whether they would be a, a concert, a festival, a, a film festival, or even just creating activations, um, you know, that were created solely for that brand. Did a lot of cool things around that time. We even um, owned a uh, film festival ourselves down in the Dominican Republic. It, and then we uh, branded and built a hotel down there with Maxim Magazine. Um, in 2005, 2006. So a lot, lot of fun during that time. Um, but yeah, it, sounds fun. It made me fall in love with live events. And that kind of was the, the, the thing that I got excited about, but never really had a technology play around live events. Um, and then fast forward a little more in the world of subscriptions, uh, I had a, a B2B SaaS company um, that was a firm for retail and franchise multi unit properties. Um, and we ended up uh, building that and selling it in 2014, effectively merged with a Italian mobile company at the time um, that was also in the multi-unit kind of space. Um, and then fast forward a little more, um, had a service business, a data analytics company uh, in the entertainment space. So you can see the, the inner weaves of all the different pieces sure. coming together. I I'm going to uh, see the theme here. Yep. Uh, and uh, we were really kind of... Um, known in the television and film space. So a lot of big companies like a &E Networks, AMC Networks, Chorus Entertainment out of Canada, and film studios, ticketing firms all would use us to help them figure out their consumer data strategy and then uh, build a platform for executing upon it. Um, during that time, there was a infamous company that people may have heard of called MoviePass uh, that uh, had a really bad business model, but a pretty good go-to-market where people actually wanted to, to engage in a subscription entertainment membership. Um, they ended up hiring my firm to help them understand their data. And I basically spent about 18 months in, uh, as their de facto chief data, data officer, um, trying to look at and understand uh, how to monetize and how to utilize data across you know millions of subscribers. Um, during that time frame, uh, a ton of light bulb went off and, and I saw that, hey, um, the live events industry, which I had a passion for, hadn't been innovated on in decades. Um, traditionally, people that want to, you know, acquire tickets to a an event, go through some of the channels of the ticketing firms that everybody knows, um, very transactionally. Um, nobody really loves or has a brand affinity towards their ticketing firm that they like. Um, usually, it's just a, a necessity in order to get the to get to the concert or the football game they want to go to. Um, but I believe there was a different way to do it. I believe there's a place for a membership community around an environment of passion connected experiences that that can allow people to be around people that they enjoy engaging with while at the same time still acquiring tickets to some of their favorite shows in a frictionless social way um, that uh, is based around a community. Um, so knowing that the live event industry is a $200 billion global industry, um, you know, we set out to kind of build that community around the live event space. Lots of questions there, uh, plenty of things we can dive into, but maybe take a step back for a second. Um, Movie Pass is of course very well known, um, certainly in subscription circles, and I think you said it yourself, as having a bad business model. So j just to take a step back, what fundamentally about that was good and, and was bad that made it ultimately not work? Yeah, the good side, good product market fit, consumers um, wanted to engage uh, in a product where they felt interesting um, passions surrounded by it. So, you know, a couple of things that I saw that were exciting is consumers really liked it. Additionally, 
they enjoyed talking about the movies they they saw. So a community got built around it where, um, you know, people just in their movie pass app, something you don't really do when you are buying tickets to a movie in general, you get a little ticket stub. You don't really keep those tickets or anything. But there were so many passionate movie movie pass fans that, you know, they'd see a hundred movies, right? And they'd have all those movies they've seen kind of recorded in their app. And it became a little bit of a pride thing that look look at all these movies I've seen. And they could kind of screenshot that and share it with other people in communities so they can engage and talk about films they like to talk about. So that that's the positive. Um, it also got uh, casual moviegoers to see more movies more often. So again, it brought more people into the theater. So those are the positive side of it. The negative was the real two fundamental issues with movie passes. One, um, they built it upon a uh, an unlimited subscription model um, that was unsustainable for the company. So at the end of the day, the company was really just subsidizing tickets. Um, so good for the consumer, but a very short-lived process. Um, and then also it became bad for the consumer over time because you know the 20% or 30% of the overall membership population were consuming, you know, the majority of the the films, meaning that the heavy, heavy users were getting a lot out of it. Uh, and then the other 70, 80% or 60, 70% weren't getting as much out of it. Right. So you want to build a business where 70 or 80% are very happy um, customers that are consuming uh, and getting value out of the platform. Um, so that was one of the the negative sides of it, and uh, and also the way they financed the company was 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 the difficult. They, it was a publicly traded holding company, and then effectively um, they had to keep keep raising money in the public markets in order to keep subsidizing the tickets. And if you own shares of that company, you were highly diluted over time because they had to keep going back to the public markets. You know, it wasn't hard to figure out basic math that said you know, the cost of movies were very expensive and the cost of that subscription, you only needed to go a couple times a month, right, to kind of for that to even out. So do you think originally there was a, hey, we'll figure out the profitability later and we will be able to figure that out? Or was there some other special sauce in the background that none of us just ever saw? Uh, there was plenty of models that would have been sustainable and would have worked. And, you know, ironically, there was a pretty good senior management team there um, that were like the rank and file senior management team, like the head of product, the CTO, the head of marketing, that all, uh, and I said in a few of those meetings, that all came down and recommended, you know, the go forward to create a sustainable uh, model with millions of subscribers that can continue to be a half a billion or a billion dollar company over time. And uh, it just it kind of was ignored at the time. So the uh, some of the, those in power chose growth over sustainability and Sometimes that's what happens. Did I hear is is MoviePass back? Did it get resurrected? It did. So the original founder, one of the original founders, there was two guys that were the original founders. One of them bought the uh, brand out of bankruptcy. Um, I don't know what he paid for it, but he bought it out of bankruptcy and just relaunched it a little likened back to the original model. Because um, MoviePass was founded back in 2012 by these two gentlemen, uh, Stacy Spikes and MA. Um, and basically, you know, they grew a slowly growing, relatively sustainable company until until somebody else bought them. And then that's when everybody heard of MoviePass when they built the Unlimited. But the the the, uh, the learning here, right, is there is a business model that works. Um, and it was just one that MoviePass didn't uh, didn't subscribe to. Uh, and one, one company that did subscribe to it that kind of set the precedent is a company called ClassPass. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with ClassPass. Mm-hmm. So ClassPass had a lot of the same problems MoviePass did. I'd say their first four or five years of, of in existence, they they did burn through a few hundred million dollars worth of capital to, to get the model right. But it was about seven, eight years ago, they, they came up with this concept, which was a credit-based currency. And what that means is that people can still pay a flat monthly fee and they receive credits for that. And they can choose to spend those credits however they so want. So it was no longer... For one monthly fee, I get unlimited, and I was no longer for one monthly fee, I get two classes or three classes or five classes um, because each of the product, each of the class uh, was a different price point. Um, so the only way to create dynamic pricing was to use a credit-based system so that one class could be seven credits, another class could be 20 credits, another class could be 50 credits, depending upon how you wanted to use that. So what it did for the business is it created a sustainable gross margin positive transaction every time somebody actually used it. Um, and it still saved money for for the consumer. It still um, provided 
traffic into the studios for all of the um, providers. And it got to a place where it worked. You know, of course, fast forward, they sold the MindBody for $1.5 billion. So they, they did well, did something right, but it, it took them to that place of creating this credit-based currency to make that happen. So being around all this, seeing everything, um, spending a lot of time with some of the people that were, uh, were instrumental in creating that credit-based currency, um, I decided that I wanted to transform the live event business in a way that we based our model on a credit-based currency. And that's what we have today. So any member that joins us pays a monthly or an annual fee. They receive credits and then they can spend those credits in over 80,000 live events. Um, so they're not only getting the value where they're getting the tickets cheaper than they would anywhere else, but they're not paying uh, additional ticketing fees, which has been a, a big rub in the, in the industry for many decades. Yeah. So let's talk a bit about your business model and where then that translates into margin for you guys, right? Um, as you already alluded to the ticket investors of the world, they, these guys are, are, are not really loved by anyone, right? The artist or the, or the concert goers, but they're making a hell of a lot of money in the process. Is your goal to kind of circumvent that, uh, kind of ticketing process and in, in, in more of a wholesale way that it going directly to the events, the artists themselves, or, you know, how does this really then grow to the point where, you know, your model makes sense? Yeah. So ultimately, um, there's primary and secondary ticketing. Um, and it's sometimes, I don't know if everybody fully understands how that works in the industry. Um, primary, more of the ticket masters of the world. And there's several, there's about a hundred different primary ticketers out there, um, that provide ticketing for the artist and for the venue in order to sell tickets. Um, then there's the secondary market, which are some of the big names people know, StubHub, SeatGeek, Vivid Seats. Um, and they play mostly in the secondary market where they resell the tickets, um, but they end up tacking on 40 to 60% fees on top of it, uh, which is how they make money. So our goal is not necessarily to circumvent or change, um, change is the wrong word. We're not trying to compete directly with those. We're, we're just trying to find a lane where we can bring people together that want to be part of a membership that they can engage in. And the more they engage in our brand and our membership and our community, the more value they get back. And it so happens to be a place where they can also get their tickets to go to live events at a better price and, you know, with transparency and in a place where they can engage in the community. Um, so again, I hope over time, like what we're building tends to become the new norm, but in no way am I trying to change or displace what currently exists out there. Um, you know, it'd be, it would be very, very hard to do because of, um, you know, a lot of the primary ticketers have, you know, decade long. Uh, contracts and relationships with the venues. I'm just trying to provide a new model for hopefully millions of members that want to join and become members of our platform um, to be able to do it a better way. Are are your members who have these credits able to pur purchase through traditional shows that may be ticketed through some of those current primary ticketing services? Yeah, yeah. So so uh, since we have so many events on our platform, we have over eighty thousand live events throughout the year on the platform. We source our tickets from various places. So some are from the secondary market, some are from the primary market. Um, but what we do is, is when we source them, um, instead of charging our members very large fees on top of it, we don't do that, right? So we source it at the same wholesale price other people do. Um, and we blend it into our overall credit system. We make sure we're making a small margin on every transaction, but we're giving away a lot of our margin to our, our members because they're uh, committing to and engaging to be a part of it. So, so uh, if somebody's a $19 a month member with us, they're paying a certain amount of dollars per credit. And if they're a $99 a month member, they're paying a certain amount of dollars per credit. So the more engaged and the more they're willing to pay on a monthly basis, um, the cheaper they get their tickets. Okay. Do the credits ever expire? Um, on our traditional web two model, uh, the answer is no. So as long as they're as long as they're a uh, a current um, paying member of the platform, their credits will continue to roll over, so they don't lose credits on a month to month basis. Um, if they totally decided to not be a member and leave the platform, then of course their credits would expire. Um, right. But uh, we do have a, a Web three model, um, which is a lifetime membership, and we can talk about that when you're ready. But that has a, a different element of how credits stack. Definitely want to dive into that in, in a second. 
But one other thing I wanted to ask you about looking at the different plans that you've got on the website is that you've also got referral bonuses. So yes. obviously customer acquisition, acquisition costs are through the roof these days. This seems like a great way to kind of build that community as you've been talking about and use them as the marketing channel to bring in new members. Is that the strategy there? It is. And then uh, what you probably are seeing as well is we have a multiplier. So the higher level of a membership you are, the more you can earn. So, you know, so for example, if you're a, a $19 a month member uh, and you invite a friend and they come in, um, you, you earn three free credits and they earn three free credits just by them coming through you. But if you're a, uh, a founding member, a $99 a month member, you have two X on your referral bonus. So you'll get double the amount. So you'll get six credits every time you refer somebody. And if you put them, if you look at that from a mathematical standpoint, right? Credits are anywhere from a dollar to a dollar twenty-seven, depending upon the level you're at. So effectively, you're you're earning six dollars, seven dollars worth of credits every time somebody new's coming in. If you're a ninety-nine dollar month member, so that's you, you. It can grow pretty quickly. You can get yourself free tickets to lots of shows if you keep telling all your friends. Absolutely, yeah, that's a great incentive, right? And I love the the tiered growth. You know, as you go up, you get the the higher referral bonus. I mean, just more incentive right there. Talk, talk a little bit about the more traditional uh, channels you guys are using for new member acquisition. I mean, this this is a model, at least MoviePass coming before you kind of laid some groundwork for people being somewhat used to that model as well as ClassPass. But how are you guys reaching out to try to acquire new members? Yeah, so on the MoviePass side, it's, it's a funny story because I I, um, I used to talk to um, the, uh, the holding company CEO every once in a while, and he would always profess that, hey, you know, we have millions of customers and we have our acquisition cost is like zero. And I said, well, that's interesting because they use PR to really drive it. So it was, it was really just about getting people and talking about the $10 unlimited, uh, monthly pass. And I was like, well, that that's great. You spent zero on customer acquisition, but you spend $20 million a month subsidizing tickets. That's pretty costly customer acquisition cost. Um, so it's, it, it's really depends on how you how you play at the card. So, but to answer your question directly is um, where we've acquired most of our traditional customers has been through just paid social. Um, you know, we've kind of got a model down where we know about how much we can pay for a free member onto the platform. Um, so somebody who actually signs into the website, sets up a profile, picks a password, tells us a little bit about themselves, what kind of things they like. Um, and we know how much that costs us to do that. Then the Assumption is, is that over time, five to 10% of those people that we've onboarded as free members will turn into paying members. Um, so that's been the traditional approach. The, the second piece that we've been testing, uh, just recently is, uh, the whole influencer world. Um, and what's fun about what we have is, um, because our product is something most influencers want themselves, um, we've been able to build a pretty substantial when I say substantial, only a few dozen now, um, influencers that uh, have joined our program where when they post about us on their socials, um, they earn free credits as well. We just amplify their amount of credits. So as an example, if you're earning six credits per new person coming in uh, as, a, as a founding member, if you're an influencer with millions of followers, we'll give you 10 or 12 free credits. So we'll kind of amplify the amount will give the uh, influencer for bringing in the um, the new users because it creates a flywheel effect. So not only do they talk about festival pass, they then earn credits and then they go to events with their credits and then they while they're at the event, they're once again talking about festival pass again. So it creates this flywheel effect of uh, what they're doing. So for example, just this recently, a couple weeks back at Coachella, we sent 19 influencers to Coachella um, using tickets from the festival pass platform who then went on to post videos and Instagram uh, stories to, you know, their collectively 50 million followers. Feels like that those influencers, especially those with larger, uh, larger base of followers could accumulate a hell of a lot of credits, possibly more than they could use. Good, good. And, and we're all for it. Right. So like the beautiful thing about that is at least we can, um, we can have metrics around what it is. Right. So if, if they have millions of followers and, they build up five or 10,000 credits on the platform, then God bless them because that means they've driven, you know, a few thousand users to our platform. 
uh, do you have, or are you thinking about a secondary market for the credit? Good question. Um, there is a secondary market for our Web3 product, uh, and we can talk about that when we're ready, but uh, uh, sure. we have not yet um, tokenized the credits. So we're very heavily into the Web3 space, which there's a lot I could talk about of what we're planning on our on a roadmap for Web3, but on the actual credits, that there it's an internal centralized credit-based system. Um, we've talked about many times um, with many people about potentially tokenizing that for the future. And currently today, I don't think there's a need for it. Um, most people that have, have the credits on the platform plan to use them to go to events. Um, so it's not like they're trying to monetize it. What's important, more important for me is adding products to the platform through which they can use their credits for. So there's more and more value. So for example, we have over 600,000 hotels on our platform. So if you have a thousand credits and you're only going to go to one or two events, um, and instead of letting your credits sit there, you can go ahead and book a hotel room using your credits. Wow. Interesting. So, uh, I, I was going to ask that as kind of a follow-up question outside of live events themselves. Are there other channels by which to use the credits? And it sounds like there are, is there besides hotels, are there others that you have or are exploring? Yeah. So hotels and, and live events are the only two right now. Um, for us, it's really about finding organic, um, channels. So. One thing that's kind of obvious is merch, uh, merchandise. Um, so we we have a bunch of partners that we've or, or t in talks with to explore that. It's really about um, just taking the resources to integrate that because obviously the only way we do it is if we can make it seamless. So meaning that, hey, uh, I'm getting Taylor Swift tickets. And by the way, here's a Taylor Swift t-shirt. Click here, spend 30 credits and get your Taylor Swift t-shirt. And have it automatically shipped from you know a third party fulfillment warehouse directly directly there, and we're ve very much on the path of doing that. Um, it just for any kind of relative startup, our our, uh, our roadmap is a few miles long in terms of the features we want to get out there. You know, you can only fry so many fish at one time. Yes, yes. Um, well, all right. Let 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 let's transition over. You've teased it a couple of times. Let's talk about your your Web three <laughs> membership, your 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 lifetime membership. I think it's a fascinating concept. Just the the, the idea of a lifetime uh, membership in general. But let's uh, tell us a little bit about what you guys are doing there. Sure. Yeah. So people can get a monthly membership. They can get an annual membership, and they can get a lifetime membership. So anybody that wants to get a lifetime membership pays for it once. Um, and once they pay for it once, they own it. And what it provides you is you immediately get $1,200 worth of credits to spend on the platform. And then every year on the anniversary date of when you bought it, you get another $1,200 to spend on the platform. So for as long as you hold that, that lifetime membership in perpetuity forever, it could be five years, 10 years, 20 years, you just constantly get $1,200 worth of credits every year to spend on hotels or, or events whenever you want. The cool thing is it's because it's a digital asset um, it's an NFT, uh, so I don't want people to get get scared when they hear the word NFT. It's it's not like the uh, the JPEGs that that uh, sell for fifty thousand dollars. It's the the reason it's a digital asset is because it controls the ability for you to actually own it. So I like to say digital asset versus NFT. And now that digital asset is you own it, and you could always resell it in the future if you want to. So you might buy it today and you might use it for a year and go to a bunch of great events. And you might say, well, hey, it's it's trading for twice as much as I bought it for. Hmm, maybe I'll sell it. And then you can go ahead and sell it uh, and, uh, you know, and potentially make more money than you bought it for. But at the same time, you could hold on to it for as long as you want and keep going to events. Oh, I assume you have a limited number of these that you're offering. Correct. Yeah. In total, we're going to sell 10,000 um, and we're selling them in... Uh, cohorts or tranches, whatever word you want to use, of a thousand a piece. So currently, right now, we're selling the first thousand, um, and once those are sold out, the price will go up, and then the second thousand will be sold, and then the price will go up. So anybody buying right now will get the best deal you can ever possibly imagine uh, of all time, all time. Uh, so the, there's only you know there's only hundreds left, um, but if they bought it today, they would pay 0.95 Ethereum. So what that translates into into money, I think Ethereum is about eighteen hundred dollars right now, um, eighteen nineteen hundred. So they'll pay about seventeen or eighteen hundred dollars 
and then they'll immediately get $1,200 back in credits. And then every year forever, they'll get another $1,200. So pretty good deal, right? You're within a year and a half, yeah. you're already getting your money back yeah. and you have it forever and you can resell it in the future. Yeah. I was, that was going to be my follow-up question. What, how long does it take to, you know, recoup that investment, I guess, since it is a lifetime membership. I think just this idea of a subscription being an asset isn't yeah. something that's associated with subscriptions at all right now, right? Because there's this ongoing financial commitment that you're making. And then of course there's the risk of cancellation, um, that, that goes along with this, but this is something that can, you know, can be, be resold. And as, especially you guys keep selling tranches of them and the price keeps going up, well, then they, uh, in effect become much more and more valuable. Right. Um, yeah. do you, where do you see that? I, I mean, this idea is still fairly new. Um, and you guys are a startup yourselves, but where do you see that going? Do you see potentially more members coming to you through that channel? And is that what you want versus the, you know, traditional pay per month or per year? Yeah, I look at it this way, right? Is that um, I think it's an amazing value to give people that are willing to support us in this uh, non-traditional asset. I'm, I'm a big fan of Web3 and I want to onboard as many people into it as possible because there's so many other things that are benefits and values outside of just owning your lifetime membership. Um, so I love it because people coming on board that have it, uh, are going to get a lot of value. And if they get a lot of value, they're going to go to a lot of events. And if they go to a lot of events, they're going to tell all their friends how amazing this product is. Um, and then these first 10,000 that own this lifetime membership become your super fans, right? So, um, you know, for us, what happens is we get some of that capital up front but most of it we're holding against the liability for the tickets into and to many years into the future. Um, so, you know, on a, on a business perspective, um, you know, doing different statistics and math about how much the usage will be is it'll take about four to five years for us to burn through kind of the funds that have come in from those sales um, in terms of paying out for the liability. And then after that, we're only going to have these 10,000, right? So it's part about creating that flywheel effect of 10,000 super users. And once they're gone, they're gone, right? So we're not going to keep selling them. Um, so it increases the value of that finite amount of 10,000. And then as we have millions of regular subscribers, people are going to you know, want to be part of the brand because they have a positive experience. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is as much as about marketing and community building as it is about a way to sell to the, to the customer. Correct. Yeah. And it, 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 you know, it's having 10,000 happy fans. Absolutely. I mean, you, you've said the word a couple of times already, and we talk about it all the time in the show about the community that subscription brands can build that just you can't do with even an Amazon subscribe and save, right? Those, those are just replenishment services. But when you've got something built around festivals, people that want to go to live events, these are very passionate people, right? Who are, are, are they, they know they're going to be doing this all the time, going to different, different events. And so they're, they're very engaged. Do you see that having this, this very identified segment of engaged consumers as valuable to the brands themselves? Meaning maybe it's a, uh, you know, it could of course be a specific artist or maybe a festival or something like that, but might they be find your customers more valuable than the ones that are going to Ticketmaster to just make one-off purchases. Yeah. And there's, we have a lot of plans and we've already built a lot of technology to help that happen. Um, yeah. so even within our own core subscription, we have these things we call micro subscriptions or, you know, effectively badges, if you will. Um, and the idea is, um, certain brands can partner with us, whether it's the venue themselves or a festival themselves to uh, almost create a mini micro subscription to add more value, right? So somebody could be a member of Festival Pass and they might have the, trying to pick, uh, you know, pick your favorite venue in Nashville, the- uh, I'm in the Ryman Auditorium. They're not a client, but that's a good example. But <laughs> they, might, they, they might have the Ryman, um, you know, mini subscription. So that you might pay an extra five bucks a month on top of your regular subscription to be part of the Ryman badge. And because you're part of that, guess what? You get special access to events that happen at the Ryman. Um, they're published on our platform for only those who are in that uh, badge uh, kind of community. And you might get other value. Um, we'll figure out exactly what the value is, but you might get other value like meet and greets or be, you know, behind the stage or you know special discounts on, on drinks or something like that. Just because you're a member 
and we'll share that subscription revenue with the theater themselves. I get real excited about this because I think subscriptions in a lot of way become became an you know uh, an economic model and not really what they once were, which were memberships were clubs, right? They were kind of exclusive. You got things that other people didn't. You got first access to them or maybe the only access to them. And that really feels like what you guys are trying to capitalize on here is kind of using that power of of being a member to give them access to things that they can't get otherwise, because otherwise they might just look at this kind of the way they used to look at movie pass, which is, all right, I can save, you know, a couple hundred dollars in some cases a month on what I would otherwise be paying for movie tickets. And, and that's not sustainable. So it sounds like you guys have found the best parts of that and are trying to put it into festival pack. Yeah. And as a membership, as you can imagine, the, um, the group, the, just like I use the word flywheel a lot, but it just once we reach a certain scale, um, the, our members become important to venues. They become important to artists. They become mm -hmm. important to different folks. So we can extract more value for our members because of it. Um, whether that means us pre-buying thousands of tickets to a specific show, having a special festival pass section and getting it for a price you couldn't get anywhere else, um, that we pass on to our members that that's valuable. Um, you know, it could be, you know, having a meet and greet with the artist only for the 500 festival pass fans that showed up that day or whatever it is. Right. So, um, that's, what's the fun part about the growth mechanism is that the larger we grow, the, the more value we can give back. This idea that you develop where you're, you buy these memberships for a, a monthly fee, but you're really getting credits that then can be used for transactions. That is a whole lot different than 99% of the other businesses out there, which are you're going to pay a price per month or per year and you're getting access to something or a fixed amount of something. Even take something like, um, you know, Panera Sip and Save Club or something like that. You get access to a coffee per day, right? Or something like that. You don't get to go in and say, well, I want a coffee and a bagel today and I'm not going to use it the rest of the month. Um, so they're kind of dictating the way you have to use their product, but it feels like you're giving your members a hell of a lot more flexibility than the average subscription. Do you see that as a model that could proliferate and, and do you think it applies to other verticals or other other businesses? Yeah, and, and I can't um, say, I, I mentioned ClassPass earlier, so I can't say I invented it, right? So um, I, I like the model they had and, and, and that's, it just fit with what we're doing. So, you know, for example, somebody that they might just love festivals as an example, even though we have, we have everything, we, we have all live events. It's just not festivals, but what, let's say they live in Austin, Texas, and they really love ACL, which is a, uh, you know, Austin city limits music festival. Um, they might say, well, Hey, I definitely want my Austin city limits tickets. And I might go to one or two other shows throughout the year. Um, so I'm going to sign up for my $99 a month plan or whatever it is and earn my credits and I'm going to use it for those big events. Somebody else might say, you know what? I love those events, but I love going to a local show, you know, twice a week. I want to go see a comedy show and I want to see a music yeah. live music show twice a week. They're each 20 credits on the platform, right? So I can basically go to, you know, eight, 10 events every month and still pay the same as that one guy that was holding off to go to, you know, ACL or something else. So the idea is it's, it's flexible enough for people to use it however they determine to. Yeah. I, I could see even some consumers thinking about this as a bit of a budgeting tool, right? Because yeah. going to live events can be hella expensive. And, you know, you've got a big expense one month and then maybe nothing for the next couple as a way to be like, all right, I, I know I can spend $50 per month, $600 a year. Um, that That's my budget. And then they kind of use that to stay within their means. Do you see some people using it that way? I agree. And, uh, and that's a lot like um, millennial and Gen Z's think, um, you know, even when we first started the company, some of our um, early investors and board members, um, advisory members are, you know, they've had a lot of experience in the millennial and Gen Z space. Um, and that tends to be kind of the way that thinking is, you know, I have a, this amount of money for rent or mortgage. I have this amount of money for food. I have this amount of money for entertainment. Um, so it, it makes a lot of sense um, to be able to budget for and because of it, um, now they're a, a member of a platform, a community, and they can engage more and even earn more. So, well, I, I guess my last question for you, and this could be a bit of a rabbit hole, but you, you know, you're you're definitely built this in a different way from a technology perspective. As you, you know, built the business even before you launched to now, 
what's been your path in terms of like what you've built versus what you've bought um, versus integration into other things? Like what what's kind of been your path and what influences your decision when you look at different uh, technologies that might be a fit? Yeah, so, um, you know, we have a relatively traditional technology stack. And, you know, again, I don't know how deep into it your listeners get, um, but, um, you know, we've built most of it as a custom platform, but we utilize a ton of different tools in order to get there, right? So, okay. you know, we're, we're a React Native site, um, which is, you know, same code base as our mobile app, which didn't actually launch yet, but will be very soon. Um, as well as utilizing typical uh, frameworks, if you will, that allow for a React-driven website to receive SEO. So we use a Gatsby framework for that. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with Gatsby. Um, but again, traditional um, tool set that exists out there that we put together. Um, the biggest thing is at the end of the day, um, we wanted to provide inventory at scale. So, you know, we tap into dozens of different API feeds in order to make sure we're getting real-time ticketing inventory into our platform, right? So we're not manually entering each event. It would be impossible at the scale that we're, that we're at. Um, so, you know, it's automated and it's constantly, um, you know, going back and pulling APIs from centralized sources, both from, both from the hotel perspective, as well as from the, the live events perspective. Yeah. What, what about the people that you've, you've hired along the way, uh, for the business? Do you, do you feel like you've, you've been able to find the people who have the right, you know, including subscription background and that level of expertise that you brought into the business or, Hey, this thing we're greenfielding anyway. So. Um, you know, everybody's kind of learning as we go. Yeah. I mean, I think anybody that ends up coming to work, uh, for the company, you know, full-time or even contractors, um, you know, spend a little bit of time understanding what we're doing and why it's different. Um, so part of it is just hoping and making sure they're believers in the, in the concept, um, cause it makes it easier to find solutions when you're a believer in the concept. Um, and then, you know, from a development standpoint, you know, we've engaged um, various resources. Our, our head of engineering has been, you know, with us from the beginning. Um, and then we, we'll scale up and down different dev teams uh, based upon timing, resources, and and what the things we're building are. Um, so, like, you know, right now I brought in an ex SEO expert to help us um, engage in some things and even uh, play around a little bit with ChatGPT so that we can better create our descriptions of our our artists, our venues, and our events, so that we can have better pickup in SEO. So we'll see where that goes. It, it just it's a way to tease and test, but it's an SEO expert that understands ChatGPT to see if we can make something happen there. Um, there's so that's it. There's definitely a lot happening there. Yeah, but but yeah, I mean, I I don't think ChatGPT or AI is overnight going to change what we're doing. But if I can find tactical ways where I can leverage it in its current state to benefit the business, then then we're going to play around with it. Awesome. Well, last question for you here, Ed. Um, I mean, you guys have come a long way already, but any any major changes, launches, announcements, or anything like that for the next one to two years for you guys? Um, well, when we're talking about Web3, again, I'm, I'm a believer, right? So in three to five years, I think every business in the world will be built on a Web3 infrastructure. Um, it just will be an evolution towards it. Um, so one of the things that we're going to do to help that adoption phase happen is currently when somebody purchases a lifetime membership, um, it, it's a digital asset, right? So they need to have it held in a in a crypto wallet. Um, and then they have to connect that wallet to our platform, which then unlocks all the free credits, they, they, the credits they can use. It takes about a three to five minute process to do so, but but it's not as seamless as, you know, it should be, right? Is uh, Web3 has not yet adopted all the cool, slick uh, UI that, Web2 has. Um, so one of the things we're doing in the next few months is you know, creating custodial wallets. And again, I don't know if everybody knows what that means. It just means you don't have to go out and get your own crypto wallet separately. Whereas everybody that signs up even for a free account on Festival Pass will just automatically receive a crypto wallet embedded in their account. Um, so that if they so desire to buy the lifetime membership, it just, it just shows up there. They don't have to do anything. It's just it immediately appears. Um, and as we add more reward driven, engagement driven, uh, digital assets, um, that it, it just automatically there. So a good example is Starbucks has leaned heavily into this space where their entire 
loyalty program is moving into Web3, um, where once somebody agrees and accepts to be into it, it will automatically create a custodial wallet right on your Starbucks app, um, which basically holds any of these digital rewards that you receive. Um, so they call them journey stamps, which is effectively NFTs that then get that you end up owning and can even sell somewhere else if you wanted to sell it. So for us, we're, we're following that kind of model that says, hey, you're going to sign up for a free account, a festival pass, or a paid account. And regardless, you're going to, um, you're going to receive this wallet and you don't even have to know about it so that when you take an action and you earn an NFT or you buy an NFT, it's automatically in your account and then you own it and then you can use it to, tra- you can use it to engage or you can, you can sell it to somebody else or you can transfer it to anybody you want. So yeah. I think that's a, that's a big kind of step forward for the industry overall and it provides a lot of opportunity for us. Absolutely. Well, uh, Ed, I really appreciate the time today. Um, for any listeners who maybe had some questions about what we talked about today or wants to learn more about Festival Pass, where should they go? Yes. So uh, go sign up right now for a free account on uh, festivalpass.com. <laughs> immediately. Um, immediately. Uh, if you if you heard the story about the lifetime asset, you want to be one of those first thousand that got that really cheap price, um, just go go right to the website. There's a little pink bar on top that will bring you right to the page. Uh, to get that lifetime asset um, and follow us on uh, Instagram at get festival pass. Uh, same on Twitter. at get festival pass and TikTok best, just festival pass. Well, Ed, again, really appreciate the time today. Appreciate all of the insights you shared about your experience and what you guys are building over there. It certainly sounds really exciting and it'll be interesting to uh, stay tuned to. So thanks again. Thank you. Appreciate it. Nick.